Hi again. Today I want to take a look at a different type of bonding, covalent bonding. Covalent bonds by and large involve nonmetals. Nonmetals we can see highlighted here in our periodic table. And don't forget hydrogen that exists over there in column number one. The goal of our nonmetals is to gain electrons and obtain the configuration of the nearest noble gas. Let's take a look at hydrogen as an example. Hydrogen has a 1s1 electron, only one electron here represented by a dot. If those hydrogens manage to share electrons, they would then have two and thereby resemble the element helium with a 1s2 configuration. And as a result, that would be a stable configuration. What happens in the case of a covalent bond is we have an attraction between the nucleus and those shared pair of electrons. That creates the glue that holds our atoms together. By and large, covalent bonds involve elements whose difference in electronegativity is less than or equal to 1.8. So in the case of my first example, hydrogen, the difference in electronegativity of these two is zero because they're the same element. Let's take a look at another example, aluminum combined with chlorine. Here the difference in electronegativity is 1.6. Although we would expect at first glance aluminum being a metal and a nonmetal, we would expect an ionic bond. In this case, the difference in electronegativity is 1.6, and this compound behaves more like a covalent compound than an ionic one. The way we represent covalent bonds is by means of something called a Lewis dot diagram. The first thing we have to understand is to focus on what are called the valence electrons. You might recall those are the ones that are available in the highest energy levels. If we look at our periodic table, here in blue I've placed what the number of valence electrons are for various elements. So we would represent hydrogen with a single dot, nitrogen with five dots, oxygen with six, and chlorine would have seven, likewise all the members of their families. In order to become stable, these atoms want to obtain the configuration of the nearest noble gas. In that case, they would like to obtain eight electrons, the exception, of course, being hydrogen, which would want to resemble helium. So let's look at how this is done. If I take hydrogen and bring chlorine nearby, they can share their unpaired electrons and form a pair. That shared pair now gives hydrogen the configuration of helium and chlorine its near, nearest noble gas, which would be argon, with eight electrons. A chlorine and a chlorine can combine. By sharing that one lone electron, they can thereby both have eight electrons and resemble a noble gas. In some jurisdictions, the shared pair of electrons can be replaced with a dashed line that represents those shared pair, but we still must show the unbonded pairs as well. Both diagrams are considered equivalent and correct. Some nonmetals can share more than one pair of electrons to become stable. So for instance, oxygen with six valence electrons can share with another six, can share two pairs of electrons and thereby obtain eight electrons. This would be represented by two dashed lines if we wanted to use the dashed line configuration. Nitrogen with five valence electrons will share three pairs of electrons to become stable and it could therefore be represented with three lines. The greater the number of bonds, the stronger of bonds. So we would expect the bond in nitrogen to be stronger than, say, the bond in chlorine. Also, the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. In this case, if we were to consider chlorine with bromine, the bond between chlorines would be stronger than the bond between bromines because chlorine is a smaller atom. I'd like to look now at a little comparison between ionic and covalent bonds by looking at three compounds. Let's first begin with chlorine bonded to chlorine, Cl2. The difference in electronegativity of these two elements is zero, and it forms what we call a pure covalent bond. In that case, we have equal sharing of those electrons. In my next bond, hydrogen bonded to chlorine, there's a difference in their electronegativities. Chlorine has a greater electronegativity, not surprising because it's closer to fluorine in the periodic table. So as a result, those shared pair of electrons will spend more time closer to the chlorine. As a result, it will develop a slightly negative charge and the other end of the molecule a slightly positive charge. This forms what we call a dipole. In our ionic bond, where the differences in electronegativity are greater than 1.8, that lone electron isn't shared. It's essentially taken by the chlorine and we form ions. 
those ions have the whole positive and whole negative charge. When using Lewis dot diagrams, we always put square brackets around substances that are ions. As far as naming covalent compounds, they have a different set of rules. By and large, we use what's called the prefix method. So for instance, my first example, carbon bonded to a single oxygen, we would call it carbon monoxide. Now I know there is only one carbon present, it is usually by convention that if there's only one of an element present, we tend to drop off the mono on the first word. We could also call it monocarbon monoxide, but again, we often leave off that first mono if there's only one of them present. My next example would be carbon dioxide. The two gets the prefix di. Nitrogen triiodide. Let's try going the other way dinitrogen tetroxide. Di meaning two nitrogens, tetra is the short for four, so four oxygens. And in my last example, phosphorus pentachloride, one phosphorus with five chlorines. Let's look at a comparison now of the properties of these covalent compounds. First of all, unlike ionic compounds, these are poor conductors in all states, solid, liquid, or gas. For my example, I'm going to consider an ice cube as my solid, formed with water molecules. And here you have the Lewis dot diagram for the water molecule. First thing, remember, in order for a substance to conduct electricity, it must have freely moving electrons or charges, or freely moving ions. In the case of the electrons, they're all tied up in the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And the water molecule itself is not an ion. So as a result, whether it's in the crystal form or whether it's in a liquid form, that water molecule and its electrons aren't free to move around, and it's not a good conductor. All these substances, covalent compounds, tend to have low melting points. Now the reason that is, is there are weak bonds that exist between molecules, inter standing for between molecules. These weak bonds are easily broken. So over in the case of ice, for instance, they break at zero degrees Celsius. It's important to note that you're not actually breaking a covalent bond. The covalent bond would require thousands of degrees to break. So when we melt covalent compounds, we're not actually breaking a covalent bond. We're breaking much weaker interbond or intermolecular interactions. We'll find out more of these in a later program. So I hope that helps. Questions are always welcome. Thanks again for watching.